The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. The problem with being a teacher, if you're going to be authentic, or being a teacher of scripture, I'm going to say if you want to be authentic, is that you have to let the text work its way through you. I'm going to confess <laughs> on the front end that I was convicted by the last chapter of Mark. Um, you're going to notice at the bottom of your handout some meditation questions. Those are actually questions I wrote for myself. I did the exegetical study Thursday and Friday, and then I got up yesterday morning and thought, well, I know all about it, and I really don't know what I'm going to say. And I thought, well, I'm just not going to open the commentary, and I took just my favorite study Bible, copy of my Bible that I like the most right now, and um, my journal, and I sat out on my back porch, and I just asked the Holy Spirit to speak to me about Mark 16, because it's a, it's a weird chapter. So I'm sharing my questions with you for what it's worth. You are allowed to, at the end of today's lesson, go, I'm so glad you had that experience with that text, Leah, not mine. Um, but that's, that's what you're getting today. Um, and maybe a little bit of study thrown in, because that was running in the background underneath. So let's start with our text, Mark 16, 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought, bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. And they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. And as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go, tell his disciples and Peter. He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Well, almost without exception, New Testament scholars maintain that Mark's gospel ended with verse 8. It's a rather abrupt ending, isn't it? Really depressing for the females in the room. Until we remember that all the men had already fled, right? <laughs> so they're not doing anything the guys haven't done. <laughs> yes, we stayed till last. We got that, yeah. Um, it was, it's such an abrupt ending that... Um, the first few centuries of the church, there were several attempts, this is what scholars believe right now, there were several attempts to provide alternate endings. The one you see on your handout in italics, some of you, your parents' Bibles may have had 9 through 16 and not mark that as possibly a later ending. Um, that ending is included in the King James Bible, and only in the last few decades has it started being bracketed off to indicate its absence in early manuscripts. Okay, so the kind of people who study these things are called text-critical scholars. Ah, sounds like an awful way to make a living. They study the history of copying biblical texts. They almost unanimously agree that verses 9 through 12 come from the 2nd century or later. All kinds of theories about missing beginnings and endings exist. And if you think about the early manuscripts would be on scrolls and you would roll that, it is likely that when you find an old scroll that, you know, has been rolled and unrolled and rolled and unrolled and sat in a cave for several hundred years and then rolled and unrolled. Maybe endings are missing or beginnings are missing. So that is one theory. Um, 
The Greek, though, in 9 through 16 is not really marking. It's not really consistent with the tone. You remember if you were here the very first week, maybe the second week when we were studying this narrative, we were talking about how kind of rushed it is. It's like Mark's kind of just the facts, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then that happened. And in Matthew and Luke, we get more of these fleshed out, put some meat on the bones, detail. It's almost like they read Mark and thought, well, you didn't really tell them all there was, you know. They, they work off of Mark, but he's 16 chapters. Matthew's, what, 28, something like that. So if you find this disturbing and raising all sorts of questions about the composition of the canon and the inspiration of scripture and all that, you're normal. Um, but I would encourage you not to be troubled by this. Um, you can geek out this afternoon or this week and read all sorts of research about the end of Mark. And, you know, I'm sure you can find a scholar that will tell you what you need to hear. Trust me. That's how they make their living. They just keep reading and writing and researching and writing more about this kind of stuff. Did you come up with a conclusion? What is your opinion? Um... I think I stand with the majority right now, but I'll tell you why at the end. Um, so thank you for asking. You've set me up well. Um, here's why I tell you I don't, I don't think you should worry about it. Um, the most important thing that we can do with Scripture is submit ourselves to the text in front of us. When we approach the Scripture and ask the Holy Spirit for his help, you know, if this much is enough if the Spirit wants to speak, and, and the Spirit will lead us into truth. When you think about it, you know, house churches in some parts of the world where Scripture is illegal, they have maybe one gospel that they pass around. They don't even have the whole canon. So we don't want to get too hung up today on, well, is it or isn't it? Because the other thing is... Um, we know the rest of the story. And what Jesus does here is just exactly what Jesus said Jesus was going to do. It is we who fail if you stop at verse 8, which is perhaps what we don't like about it. Um, there's nothing about Jesus that changes. The tomb is still empty, and he kept his word. The abrupt part is what the women do here. In the first seven verses, we get what we expect. It's early in the morning. The women show up at the tomb and find it empty. A young man exhorts them not to be afraid. Jesus has gone ahead of you to Galilee. He gives them instructions about telling the other disciples, meeting Jesus in Galilee. It's all unfolding exactly like Jesus said it would unfold until verse 8. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Again, we just don't look very good here as humans. But maybe that is Mark's intention. Mark has hinted in, verse, in chapter 15, verse 40, and I didn't talk about this last week because we covered a lot in chapter 15 and couldn't get to this. But Mark has hinted in 1540 that these women, um, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome, were watching from a distance. Do you remember that phrase? We talked about the followers. We talked about Peter. You know, they're all right there moving along with Jesus. And then by Thursday night, they're kind of hanging back a little bit. And by Friday, they're like, I don't even know that guy. So that phrase, from a distance, indicates beginning to move to the periphery. So perhaps, um, perhaps the women are no longer up close before this moment even comes. They're not like Simon of Cyrene that carried the cross or the Roman centurion who literally stood up under the cross. And do you remember the, the verbs of perception we've talked about in this gospel? The Roman centurion seeing, perceiving, seeing with the eyes of the Spirit, how he died declared him to be the Son of God at the crucifixion. We can't be sure about the women and the phrase following at a distance, 
but it does seem like a hint given that Mark has used this language before. So Mark tells us, um, I do want to say, I, I got to look at you and say this, Sheila. I want to give them a little credit for coming here and tending to the body of Jesus. They don't come expecting anything miraculous, but they are going to come and tend to his body. So let's look back again at those first few verses. When the Sabbath was over, Mark tells us, very early on the first day of the week. So it's what time? Sunrise. Sunrise. Very early. To Four. Be four, five, whatever time the sun was coming up. I want you to just flip to the back briefly. I gave you a copy of Psalm 19. There is nothing in the text that echoes that. This was just me and my devotional yesterday morning. But when I read that, I thought, oh, sunrise. Look at verse 5 of Psalm 19. Well, the end of verse 4. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other, Nothing is deprived of its warmth. Who is the bridegroom as we come to know him in the New Testament? Jesus. Jesus. So I can hardly watch a sunrise without thinking of this verse of, nine, of Psalm 19, verse 5. When I see a sunrise, the word bridegroom coming, that light will never cease to find you, Leah. It will be there every morning, the light of Christ. So, again, for what that's worth, that's my personal connection. Nobody in a study Bible has written that. Take it or leave it. So the women come here with no expectation. Apparently, they have not perceived, not seen any, you know, seen or heard any better than their male um, followers, counterparts. They are not expecting wonder or miracles or mystery. No, they have come to anoint a body. And they've brought the spices to do so. They are going to cover the smell of the decaying flesh. Um, the Jewish ritual, burial ritual, they lay, some of y'all that have been to Israel probably saw this. We did when I went. They lay the body in the tomb on sort of this shelf-like thing, and the body would decay. And then after a year, the family would go back and collect the bones and put them in something called an ossuary. So this was Jewish tradition to do this. So they're just doing their, their custom. So they've come here according to their custom, expecting nothing, no mystery or ritual, I mean, or miracle. Their imaginations, we might say, are limited by their own traditions and custom. Um, that's evident in the question they ask. What is the question they ask? Who's going to move the rock? Who's going to move the rock? They are looking around them for human resources. Who's got strong arms? I had to, I somehow missed high school physics, so I had to ask Aisha yesterday. If you had to move a really big rock in ancient times, <laughs> he said you need a lever and a fulcrum. <laughs> yes, <laughs> clearly I missed physics. So who's got a lever and a fulcrum? How are we going to get to the body of Jesus? There will be a stone in our way. This is horizontal vision. What we see in these women is that it's quite possible to follow Jesus for an extended period of time and to hear his teaching and to still misunderstand Remember that Mark is writing this gospel to the early church. And could this be what he's trying to say through this vignette that we're looking at here? Just these eight verses about this woman. Then notice in verse 4 what the women do. Somebody tell me. Verse 4, what do the women do? They looked up. Oh. The Greek verb here is the verb anablepo. It means to look up. It also means, get this, 
to recover sight. It is the same word, same verb that Mark has used two times when Jesus raised his eyes to heaven just before he did miracles in chapter 6, verse 41, and in 7, verse 34. In 631, Jesus, anablepo, he looks up to see, perceive what was to be done in the moment with five loaves and two fishes. He looks up and then he blesses it and breaks it and feeds the multitude. He does it again, Jesus, anablepo, he looks up and then he touches the ear and the tongue of the deaf mute and the man is healed. So here we have these women, Anablepo, looking up. They can see reality now. The stone is gone. The obstacle that they have anticipated is no longer there. That I would call vertical vision. So my first question for myself and maybe for you is, are you looking up or are you looking around? God himself has moved the stone. The cut covenant with himself God of Abraham, the part the Red Sea God of Moses has moved the stone. Jesus himself has removed the barrier to his body. Okay, I had a moment when I realized that. I just had a moment when I wrote that sentence. (laughs) That's the Eucharist. Maybe that comes from doing this every single Sunday like we do. Jesus removes the barrier between us and his body. He forgives us and he invites us to the feast. Those of you have gotten an email from me know I usually sign all is grace. It really is. This really is who we are. He does it all. From cutting covenant with Abraham to parting the Red Sea for the children of Israel to moving the stone from out in front of his body. He washed the feet and he fed bread and wine on, on, at the Passover, Monday, Thursday, we call it, to those who are going to follow at a distance, deny him, and even betray him. Y'all, it's good news and we're not even to verse 5 where the really good news is. I mean, it's already good. So my second question is, what's the stone between you and Jesus? Probably don't want to answer that aloud. But we all have one. It's a prayer this week. We can pray, Lord, is there a stone between you and me? What am I looking at horizontally and you want me to look up and show me that you've already done it? So verse 5, what happens next We have this young man. This is called an angelophany. So there's your $5 seminary word for the week. You can throw that one around at work and impress somebody if you can say it. I have to practice saying that one. Angelophanies um, follow a pattern, human fright, followed by an exhortation, do not be afraid. If you think about it, you know, we've all got the, the narrative of Mary in our minds when Gabriel shows up. What's the first thing he says to her? Don't be afraid. That's what they always say. And then the next part will be further revelation. So there's this pattern. But what's interesting is Mark does not call this person an angel. Rather, he refers to him as a young man in white robes, though clearly it is an angel. Why might Mark use that expression, the young man in white robes? Do y'all remember the last young man in white robes we saw in the book of Mark? The streaker. Yes, the man that ran away. He was trying so hard to not be associated with Jesus that when he started to run away, he left his clothes behind. Now, these are not the same guy, let me be clear. But there, is, there are some scholars, I didn't make this up, There are some scholars who say Mark here is giving us a picture of redemption. You've got one person, one man in white robes that flees, and another man in a white robe who announces resurrection. So there's this reversal going on. 
One flees, another announces and proclaims the resurrection. Now that Jesus has risen from the dead, the first Adam has been replaced by the last Adam. The old covenant is replaced by a new one. The curse from Genesis is broken. The fall no longer holds us captive. All things, all, including you and me, are being made new already. Now, as Bishop Mim said this morning, we still live in a broken world. Our flesh is still decaying. Some of us faster than others. But it is being made new. That's the truth. The young man, he knew who the women were looking for. And notice how straightforward his answers are. Look in verse 6. Don't be alarmed. You were looking for Jesus who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look at the place where they laid him. Go tell his disciples, especially Peter. I love that detail. He is going ahead of you into Galilee, specific place. You will see him there just as he told you. This isn't just seeing. This is perceiving, seeing, look up kind of seeing. So my next question is, what is the last thing Jesus said to you? What is the last thing that he said? For the disciples, if you went back to Mark 14, verses 27 to 31, this is what he said to them. You will all fall away, Jesus told them. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. There it is, right there, very specifically. I mean, he really wasn't trying to keep secrets, was he? He was not being elusive. He was not being obscure. The obscurity is here and here. But he was as clear as he could be, and is exactly what this angel is now saying to these women. Then Peter declares, verse 29 of chapter 14, even if all fall away, I will not. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. I think sometimes in that story about Peter, we miss that last sentence. Did y'all hear that? And all the others said the same. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. What was the last thing Jesus said to the chief priest when they asked him if he was the Christ? I am. Yes, you have, you have said so is what he's going to say to Pilate, which is basically the same thing twice. He says, I am, to the chief priest, and then to Pilate, when he's asked if he's the king of the Jews, he says, you have said so. In your spirit, what is the last thing you've heard Jesus say to you? In your reading of scripture, in your moments of prayer, maybe as you are singing, maybe as you are kneeling at the rail, what is the last word? Was it a word of invitation? Was it a word of conviction? Was it just beloved, your beloved? Life-giving? For me lately, it's been conviction about my image of God. He is still freeing me from idolatry, of making him to be like a strict parent, or making him be like the harsh director of a play who's disappointed in me when I don't get my lines right. I make images in my mind of God that are not love. I think it's Calvin. I, did, I thought of this early this morning and I added it and I didn't look it up. I think it's Calvin that says the human mind is an idol factory. Anybody, any Calvin 
people know whether he said that or not. I'm going to go with it, Steve. I'm going to say he did. I think it's got Bob, do you know? I don't know. Calvin Luther, one of those reformers, said the human mind is an idol factory. But the most fundamental thing that we know about God is what we're teaching our two-year-olds upstairs. God is love. love. It's the first thing we teach. God is love. That is the very nature of God. That is not one characteristic, one attribute. It is his essence. He's love and he's light and in him is no darkness at all. Hence the angel angelophany pattern. Do not be afraid. So let's look at verse 8. Mm. The women are overcome with terror and dread. They fled. They said nothing because they were afraid. Yes, it is a hard ending. We want them to do better. What was it Bishop Mim said this morning about something and do better? He was talking about his days as a Baptist. Try harder. Try harder. That was it. Try harder. We want them to try harder right here. But what did Jesus say in chapter 14 that I just read you? The shepherd will be struck and the sheep will flee, including every last you and lamb. All we like sheep have gone astray, Isaiah told us. That is the default setting of human beings. And the sooner we repent of our pride and know ourselves, the easier the journey gets. We will run away in terror. I think, here's the answer to your question, Corky. I think Mark might be reminding us of who we are as the church. We do know from other New Testament writers the rest of the story. I think Mark leaves his story unfinished because we don't write the story any more than we roll the stone away. We would like to think that, well, the Spirit came at Pentecost and then we went out and changed the world, right? And look what we've done for the last 2,000 years. How pretty is the church? But we're not the ones who really build the church. It's almost, this isn't in my notes, but I think about this a lot, this image. It's almost like you dads and granddads that you're going to let your grandchildren think they're driving. And so you put them in your lap, and you're going maybe down a country road, and the little little person has their hands, but you've got your big hands on that steering wheel, and you've got a foot on the brake and a foot on the gas. But man, that little girl or that little guy, they think they're driving, don't they? That's to me what it looks like to be in God's kingdom. I'm really just this little kid, and I get to feel like I'm doing something that matters, and I get to feel like and enjoy being part of the kingdom and having a gift and bringing my gift and contributing. But the fact of the matter is, God owns the cows on a thousand hills and he has got plenty of loudmouth Sunday school teachers out there. Plenty of folks that could be deacons. He doesn't have to have any of us, but he lets us. He invites us. But he's got control and he's the one stopping and starting. That's what it looks like to me. So I think maybe Mark left it this way, if in fact he did, because we don't write the story. He does. Perhaps Mark's inspiration was to write his account in a way that holds a mirror up to us. The church did not get built because we're courageous or smart or have great strategies or we make better decisions and always do the right thing in the hard moments. The church got built because Jesus rounded up his followers just as he said he would and he poured out his resurrection power on them and that's what built the church. Not our ideas, not our strategies, not our strengths. In fact, our weakness, our emptiness filled by him, our weakness strengthened by his spirit. That's what builds us. 
So the last question I have for you and for me, will you let yourself be found? Will you let Jesus meet you on the beach of the Sea of Galilee like he did Peter? Will I let him cook me breakfast and lavish me with a feast even when three days ago I know that I denied him? And that's what I was referring to when I talked about, for me, lately has been conviction about my image of God. When I mess up, then my tendency is to follow at a distance. I I don't want the feast because now I don't think I'm worthy of the feast. But he plainly told me, you're a sheep. This is what you're going to do in hard times. And knowing that doesn't mean I'm not going to do it again. I will till the day I die. But knowing that puts me right back in that place of dependence on him. Maybe, I think it was Brennan Manning that said that what the Christian life looks like, spiritual maturity, you, you still fall off the wagon. You just don't stay off as long. You, you, you cry help from the ditch quicker. Maybe three years off, And then you come back to the Lord. And then as you get older and walk with him longer, three months, and then you come back to the Lord. And then you maybe get old enough and and you've walked with him long enough and you trust him a little bit more. And so then you only stay off three days and then maybe you move along. And then your fall off only lasts three hours. And maybe before we go to the grave, our fall off will only last three minutes or three seconds. But we're going to fall. The question is, will will we let him come find us and bring us back over and over again? So as I said, we know the rest of the story. I hope you're not troubled by this current text-critical scholarly debate. You, if you have a Bible that's probably 50 years old or newer, you will see that portion bracketed. But in two centuries, we may have some new archaeology, and they go, oh, you know what? We found an even older script, and it was there all along. And there's even debate about which portions those are. So this is, this is sort of what we know right now. I don't know about you, but I found plenty in verse 8 to stir my heart and to bring me back. And I pray that for you, too. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for being a God who rolled the stone away, who showed us how to look up, who tells us who we are, the truth about who we are, and loves us anyway and all the way. Lord, help us not to be afraid to be found by you not to be afraid to stand before you with all of our mess, whatever it is. We thank you, Lord, that you've invited us to be a part of your kingdom, that you let us sit in your lap and quasi-drive. Lord, may we not forget that it is you who are all of the power and all of the glory. I pray your blessings on each of these friends, Lord, and as we take a break from study for a few weeks, that you would refresh us and renew us. pray in Jesus' name. Amen.